In this video, we take a look at measurements, the uncertainty that exists within them, SI units, the conversions between different units, and density. So measurement involves a quantity and a unit. Having just a quantity doesn't really give any purpose to that measurement unless there's a unit that is attached to it. And measurements are a fundamental piece of the experimental sciences. Most experiments involve taking some sort of measurement to then present as data that goes along with that experiment. So it's important to be able to take a measurement and understand, is that measurement correct? Or could I have made a mistake and does it make sense? Or could there be an error involved? Oftentimes in science, these measurements involve really large and really small numbers. So we use scientific notation to make those numbers much more easily worked with. So it's a way of taking really big numbers and making them smaller and really small numbers that involve lots of zeros and making again, a smaller amount of digits that are involved for that measurement. So it's taking the measurement and again, eliminating a lot of the zeros that are involved and just shrinking it down to a number that is a, a coefficient between uh, one and something less than 10. So there's one non-zero digit to the left of the decimal and then some power of 10 uh, that involves how many times that decimal point had to be moved to make that number much more manageable. So here's a couple of different measurements that involve taking numbers in science and making them something much more easy to work with. Looking at the Earth and how far it is from the Sun, it's 149 billion 600 million meters from the Sun. But again, that involves a lot of zeros, a really large number I have to write over and over and over. So we're going to take that number and convert it into scientific notation. And here we see we had to move the decimal point 11 places to the left. We had to make that number 10 to 11 times smaller. So taking that 1.496 and multiplying it by 10 to 11, again, will make it back 10 to 11 times larger. So we can say it's 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters from the sun. It works for really small numbers too, looking at the size of an atom. So this atom of carbon is 0 0.00000003 meters in width. Again, that's a lot of zeros to have to work with. You have to write over and over and over, and we can much more easily shrink it down by moving those zeros now to the right. And again, we made that number now 10 to the ninth times larger, so we have to multiply by some to make it 10 to the ninth times smaller. So we can just write this as 3 times 10 to the negative 9 meters in width. And these measurements have what we call significant figures, numbers that were actually measured numbers, numbers that are known to the person that took that measurement, giving other people an idea of how specific a measurement was, how precise a measurement was. So it's all values that are known by that instrument that was used to take the measurement plus one more estimated value there out. And so we can look at these measurements and the numbers involved to get an idea again of how precise that measurement was, how good of an instrument was used to take that measurement. And then oftentimes we use calculations with them, which are also going to involve significant figures. Here, this looking at this blue line, we see that again, it's eight units long, but not quite nine units long. And you wouldn't say that it's eight or nine because clearly you can see it's neither. And so you'd report this to somewhere between eight and nine. You'd estimate roughly how far between eight and nine that measurement is. And I called it 8.6 units. But should it be something more exact, like we see this green line, and again, to let the person know who sees this number just how exact your measurement was, you have to report out again to that tenth place because you are saying it was seven and exactly on that line, not that it was an estimated between a six and an eight, and it was roughly halfway between calling it seven, that it's actually 7.0. My instrument measured to the ones place and I estimate out to the tenths place. So taking a look at these numbers, how do you know which digits are significant, which ones are not, which ones are really just placeholders? So the first rule of looking at a number to determine how many significant figures there are is every non-zero digit within a number is significant. So any number again that isn't a zero, one, two, three, all the way up through nine, are significant digits. So in the measurement that would involve 123 centimeters, all three of those figures would be significant. Second rule involves zeros that happen between numbers. Again, those zeros are actually measured zeros, so they are significant digits. So in a number like 1001 kilometers would be four significant digits. The one, the two zeros in between and the one on the end, all four are significant. The next one looking at really, really small numbers when you have a zero then a decimal and another bunch more zeros like we had with the size of the atom. All those zeros there are just placeholders. They're just making sure that it gives a value to that measurement and they're not actually measured out zeros. And that's why when 
we changed it to scientific notation, it was just 3 times 10 to the negative 9, not 3.0000000 times 10 to the negative 9. Again, those zeros were just placeholders, so there was only one significant digit in that number. So when you change it to scientific notation, it still remains just one significant digit. However, oppositely, when you have zeros at the end of a number that are after a decimal, like we saw with the 7.0, units as we measured before those are significant zeros because you were telling the person that is reading that number your instrument was able to measure out to that place that that was a measured zero unlike zeros that are at the end of a really large number and there's an understood decimal like a hundred thousand that would only be one significant digit those five zeros again are just holding the place of the ones the tens the hundreds the thousands and the ten thousands place if you took those zeros away you would change the value of that number, but they weren't actually measured zero, so it is just one significant digit. And the last rule is that it's unlimited if it's a counted or known value. So again, if you're doing conversions involving these units, it's not going to change the amount of significant figures, or also if it's a counted number, then it's really infinite number of significant digits because you know it's an exact number. And again, oftentimes we do calculations with these numbers, so there's rules that go with doing calculations also. Because you can't end up getting a number that is more precise than any of the numbers you used before. You can't gain significant digits just because you've done calculations with them. So when you're doing adding or subtracting, you round to the least known place. So if you had three numbers that were to the tenths, the hundredths, and the thousandths place, you have to round to the tenths place because the least precise instrument you use only went to the tenths place. And then when you do calculations involving multiplying and dividing, you round to the one that had the least amount of significant figures. So if you had a number that had two sig figs, and then another number that had three, and then another number that had four, then you have to round to only two significant figures for that measurement. In science, we use SI units. Again, System International is what it stands for. It is an international system of units that was adopted in 1960, originally developed in France in 1795. And it just gives scientists a way to readily understand data and make a decision on that data without having to do a bunch of conversions themselves. It's kind of like everyone speaking the same language. It's tough when you have one person speaking Spanish and somebody else only knows Russian and you have to go from Spanish to English to Russian and what can get lost in translation. So what happens is with science, we just, everyone uses the same units rather than have to just convert between these different ones and everyone is on the same exact page. So there's six different base units for SI units. For length, it's the meter, and it's represented by a lowercase m. Mass is kilogram. It's the only one that actually has a prefix that goes with it because grams are so small, it's really not useful to use on its own. So kilograms, which is about 2.2 pounds, is what we use for the base unit of mass. For temperature, it is Kelvin, and we don't use Fahrenheit ever. And to get from Celsius to Kelvin, it's an easy conversion, which we'll view in a couple minutes. For time, it's seconds, lowercase s, and for the amount of substance is moles. These are really all the ones we're going to discuss in chemistry, but there are two other ones which be involved in physics, electrical current, the ampere, and light intensity is the candela. And again, we won't discuss any of those this year, just those other five is really all we're going to look at. Like we saw with the kilogram, there are different metric prefixes that go with powers of 10 and Take those units and they attach to every unit you can put it in front of any unit you want whether it be the meter or a gram or a second all these prefixes can be added to them so for really really large numbers first we start with giga 10 to the ninth times larger uh, mega is 10 to the sixth or a million times larger like a megabyte and a gigabyte uh, kilo is 10 to the third times larger a kilometer or kilogram as again as we already saw uh, hecto 100 times larger and deca is 10 times larger the other ones are then for getting powers of tens smaller uh, deci one tenth of a given unit whether deci meter deci gram doesn't matter uh, centi 10 to the negative 2 or 100 times smaller milli a thousand times smaller micro a million times smaller 10 to the negative 6 and nano and pico we won't use too too much but again those are other metric prefixes that do come in handy in science so for length again the base unit is the meter but from that there are other useful units which we were going to discuss um whether it be the centimeter meter kilometer and again you pick whichever 
prefix makes sense for the size of the measurement that you're taking. In science, oftentimes we use volume, which is derived SI unit. It's a three dimensions of length, length times width times height. It's how much space matter occupies. And for solids, we're going to use centimeters cubed. And for liquids and gases, we'll speak in terms of liters. There's other common units like the milliliter and microliter from really, really smaller sized um, amounts. But also you can go larger. Kiloliters is a possible uh, unit also but we won't talk things on that scale so next up is temperature again for fahrenheit and celsius it's a pretty easy conversion between them we're not really going to use celsius much ever at all but to get from fahrenheit into celsius you subtract 32 and then multiply by five ninths to get from celsius to fahrenheit you're going to multiply by five ninths and then add 32. but more often than not we're going to be, be talking celsius to kelvin and that's just a simple conversion of adding 273 to the degree celsius or to get from Kelvin back to Celsius, you'd subtract 273. And as you see, it's just Kelvin, not degrees Kelvin. It is degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, but just Kelvin. There is no degrees associated to Kelvin. Conversion factors. Conversion factors are used to get between two different measurements of different units. It's a ratio of these equivalent measurements. So since it's their ratio and their equivalent, you're just multiplying by one. You're not changing the overall value, just changing units. So as we see here with meters and centimeters, we can say there's one meter in 100 centimeters or is 100 centimeters in one meter, depending on if you're trying to convert from centimeters to meters or meters to centimeters. And again, it's a way of taking different quantities and changing them to a different unit, but keeping the value the same. And the process of these conversions between these different units is called dimensional analysis, a way to analyze these different units through these different dimensions of which we are changing measurements. And sometimes it's a simple one-step conversion. Other times it might involve three or four different steps of changing from one unit to a different unit over and over and over. It might give you a different way of problem solving. Again, changing between different units, picking comparisons between different units. And it allows you to, again, to convert from one set of measurements to a different set of measurements without changing the value of the measurement that was originally taken. So starting with one, you've probably done something similar to, but haven't actually done out the correct process is converting between hours and seconds. So looking at an eight hour workday, how many seconds are there in total of the eight hour workday? So we're gonna take our given unit that we started with at eight hours and put it over one just to make a fraction out of it because we are gonna multiply it by a fraction. It'll keep us from making a silly error later on. So now if I take that relationship of one hour to 60 minutes, putting hours on the bottom, now I see hours will reduce out getting me two minutes and I can do the same thing from minutes into seconds and again one minute and 60 seconds are an equal measurement so I can use it as a conversion factor now again that minutes reducing out leave me at the unit of seconds and I find that there are 28,800 seconds in an eight hour workday. This can also be used in other situations where you have different comparisons of different units that are again equal to each other so looking here where I have a 50 gram spool of copper and I need 1.84 grams of copper wire for each student, how many students can I get to do this experiment? So I'll still start the same way of taking my 50 grams over one, taking my given unit, putting it over one, and now putting some sort of relationship that equals one next to this that allow me to get rid of units which I have, getting to units that I want. And I know there's 1.84 grams of copper for every student that's going to be doing this experiment. So again, grams of copper are going to reduce out, leave me with students, and I find it to be 27.174 students. Although that's not a very useful number when we're talking about students, so I find 27 students can do this experiment. And the last topic we're going to discuss is density. So oftentimes, you know, when you're in elementary school, you fall for this, which weighs more, a pound of steel or a pound of aluminum? And you say, oh, it's got to be the steel. I know steel weighs more, but in reality, they weigh the same. But you think steel weighs more because it has a greater density and you classify it as being heavy. But in reality, the, a pound of each is a pound of each. It just takes a lot more aluminum to equal a pound than the steel. We see that here looking at lithium and water and lead. I have 10 grams of each, but I need a lot more lithium because it has a much lower density than I do water, than I do lead. And that's what makes you say lead is so heavy because so little of it would equal out 10 grams, but I need so much lithium to equal out 10 grams. So as you can see from the units, the grams per centimeter cubed, we know density is the ratio of an object's mass to its volume. And more simply put, D equals M over V. And it is 
an intensive property though because it has to do with the makeup of what's going on. So as the volume gets larger, as does the mass at the same rate.